Anyway, I appreciate uh, being invited here to speak today. And uh, you know, there's a lot of fear. Uh, there's a lot of fear. I, I thought I was being connected with the microphone here. Uh, I guess I'll just ignore this. Um, there's a lot of fear about guns these days. It's pretty hard to avoid it. Um, the uh, uh, you run into all the time. I have a dentist uh, who I was going to a while ago, and uh, he had gotten married about a year ago. He had grown up with guns. He had served in the military. And uh, uh, but recently uh, he'd gotten married and they had had a child and one of the things that his wife had insisted was that they remove all guns from the home. He, I guess, didn't quite agree with it, but it was not something he was going to be arguing with his wife about. I, uh, another case, uh, I had a friend of mine, a colleague, who, uh, whose wife had gone to the doctor and uh, she had gone through the normal questions about family history the doctor had with her. and. And, but one of the questions they came to was whether or not they owned a gun in the home. And the doctor, of course, then emphasized when they, she found out that she had the gun that uh, she hoped that, that they at least kept it locked up and that they would hopefully consider not even owning the gun. And I've run into similar situations where I've taken our own boys in for their annual medical checkups. I'm sure you all have probably run into similar types of stories yourself over time. And it's understandable the types of fear that people have about guns, uh, given the amount of news coverage about accidental gun deaths or other crimes that occur with guns. The question I'm concerned with, though, is whether this fear about guns actually increases people's safety or makes them, makes them less safe. Because I think the bottom line to everybody is really the same. The bottom line is, on net, does the presence of guns save lives or cost lives, and what impact do they have on the crime rates that threaten so many of us? And um, uh, a lot of this fear, as I say, I think is driven by the media. And, and, and <clears throat> people, I think, feel that they know a lot about guns and f because of all the attention that you see in the media. We think we have some empirical basis for our judgments because of the news stories that relate to us crimes or other types of horrible events that happen with crimes. My, my concern, though, is that we constantly hear only about the bad things that happen with guns and rarely hear about the benefits. I mean, one question you may want to think to yourself is when was the last time you heard a story on the national evening news about someone using a gun to go and stop a crime? or to save lives in, in some general case. My guess is most people, when they think about it, what do you want? They are, uh, are probably not going to be able to think of too many cases like that. And most people would be sh surprised or shocked to learn that our best estimates indicate that people use guns defensively about two million times each year. That's about five times more frequently than the best estimates we have for how many times guns are used in the commission of crimes. There are lots of ways, I think, to kind of illustrate this asymmetry. I'll just spend a couple minutes on that. And that is, uh, you know, just a few weeks ago, we had a, uh, a robbery that took place in, uh, in New York City at a Wendy's restaurant in which five people were brutally killed by the two robbers. And that understandably got a fair amount of national news coverage for, for a week or so. But I know of four cases within just a few days of that where citizens around the country used concealed permitted handguns to stop similar types of robberies. You have a situation just a few days earlier prior to the Wendy's case where a 70-year-old man in Indianapolis, Indiana stopped two robbers uh, from robbing a convenience store. Uh, the robbers had made it very clear to the three clerks at the convenience store that they were going to uh, uh, be killed afterwards. Uh, one of the sales clerks in particular was completely convinced that uh, they were going to be killed after the people had gotten the money. And, uh, uh, but they were stopped by this, uh, by this older man who had a permit to carry a concealed handgun. The day of the, uh, the Wendy's attack, there was a robbery in Florida where a robber had used a knife to severely slash two uh, sales clerks there and was, was threatening to do serious da damage to them further. When a 53-year-old woman pulled out a permanent concealed handgun, announced that she had a permit to carry the concealed handgun, pointed it at the robber, ordered him to drop the knife or said she was going to shoot, uh, 
repeated her threat a second time, upon which she dropped the knife, and she held him there until police arrived. There was another case uh, in Fort Worth, Texas, just a couple days afterwards, where uh, a robbery at a grocery store was stopped, where it was pretty clear that the robber frustrated that he wasn't able to get the money from the, uh, uh, the cash uh, register at the front, was threatened to go and kill people in the grocery store. But he was stopped by uh, a 50-year-old man who had a permit. And I could go on and give you other cases. But none of those cases got news coverage outside of their local media markets. And I think part of the reason is, is that nobody was killed. And one could imagine if, uh, if the 70-year-old man hadn't been there in the case of the Indianapolis case and people had been killed, whether that would have gotten the same type of national news coverage as you got in the Wendy's case. But I think it goes beyond that. Um, uh, yeah, I think if you just generally look at news events and you have, uh, let's say, a situation where you have a dead body on the ground uh, and it's a sympathetic person like a victim. And another case where, let's say, a woman's brandished a gun and a would-be attacker's run away, no shots are fired, no dead body on the ground, no crime actually committed, I don't think you need a conspiracy story to understand why the first case might be considered more newsworthy than the second case. You're not even sure what crime would have been uh, prevented in the case of the woman who brandished the gun. But even though it might not be as newsworthy, if we care about the bottom line, about what types of policies are going to save the most lives, we need to pay attention not only to the newsworthy bad events, but the events that never become newsworthy because people are able to protect themselves. Now, I don't think that that explains all the news coverage. I'm happy to go through it more in depth later on, because I don't think it explains why things like public school shootings that have been stopped by citizens with guns why those don't get very much news coverage, or I don't think it explains some other instances we could go through. But um, I think it help explains, in part, a lot of the fear that exists there. Because my guess is that if some of these types of situations where citizens use guns to go and save lives, even if they weren't in proportion to the rate at which people use guns defensively nationally, but, but as, even if there were at least some cases, my guess is it would make a big difference in the debate that we have right now in terms of a lot of the laws that are being talked about and what people think should be done. Before I, I get, maybe get back into that, what I'd like to try to do is uh, deal with a couple broad issues. The first one is deal with some myths that I think uh, relate to guns and crime that I think are more likely to endanger people's lives than they are to save them. And then I'd like to spend a little bit of time trying to go through some systematic numbers on the impact of uh, different types of gun laws on crime rates and accidental gun deaths. Um, just to go through the myths, I think the first myth to go through is the notion, is the issue of what someone should do when they're confronted by a criminal. What's the safest course of action that you should take? And if you look through newspaper articles or in the media, one thing that very frequently comes up is the claim that people should behave passively when they're confronted by a criminal. And there's a kernel truth to that. If you push somebody who makes that claim to back it up and assuming they're knowledgeable, they'll point to something called the National Crime Victimization Survey. And that's done by the Department of Justice each year. And they survey about 50,000 households. And indeed, uh, as I say, there's a kernel truth to it. If you compare passive behavior to all forms of active resistance together, passive behavior is slightly safe. The problem is, and the reason why I think it's misleading, is that people, I think, come away with that with the notion that passive behavior is preferable to any type of active resistance. And that's simply not true. Because under the heading of active resistance, you're lumping together all sorts of different things, everything from using your fist, yelling or screaming, running away, a baseball bat, mace, a knife, or a gun. Some of those actions are indeed much more dangerous than passive behavior, but some are much safer. And I think just kind of lumping them together confuses the issue and is likely to have people make mistakes. If you take a woman, for example, by far the most dangerous course of action for a woman to take when she's confronted by a criminal is to use her fists. There's a pretty simple reason for that, and that is you're virtually always talking about male criminals doing the attacking. In the case of a female victim, 
you're talking about on average a pretty large strength differential between the average male attacker and the average female victim. And for a woman to go and use her fists results in a very high likelihood of the attacker responding physically and conditional on that a high probability of serious injury or death to the woman. When you break down the different types of active resistance, what you find is that particularly for women and the elderly, people who are relatively weaker physically, by far the safest course of action for someone to take is to have a gun. Women, for example, who behave passively when they're confronted by a criminal are 2.5 times more likely to end up being seriously injured than a woman who has a gun. Men also benefit, but not, not anywhere near as much. Men who behave passively are about 1.4 times more likely to end up being seriously injured than a man who has a gun. Um, another myth that I'm sure uh, we've all heard about is the claim that uh, most murders are committed by acquaintances. And uh, uh, again, there's a kernel truth to it, uh, but again, I think it's fairly misleading. It's basically based upon two pieces of evidence. One is that if you go and look at the FBI Uniform Crime Reports, indeed about half of the murders in 1997 are committed by so-called acquaintances. It's also based upon the notion that anybody could go out and commit a murder. Now, if you look at the first point, indeed it's true. That's what the FBI numbers say, that but almost exactly 50% of murders are committed by acquaintances. The problem is, is that I think that when most people hear that, they come away with the notion of an acquaintance being some people who are emotionally close to each other in some way. And in fact, nothing could be further from the truth. We don't have precise numbers on this at the national level, but it appears most likely that the largest category of acquaintance murders involves rival gang members who are fighting each other. That if you have... If, if you have rival drug gangs fighting against each other in a city, it's quite common for the members of one gang to know who the members of another gang are. And it's quite common for the police to likely to know whether these guys know each other or not. But acquaintance murders is even much broader than that. Acquaintance murders are going to involve murders involving drug buyers and drug sellers, involve murders involving prostitutes and johns or their pimps, uh, if a cab driver here in the San Francisco area picks up somebody that he perceives as a would-be fare, and two seconds after the person gets in the cab, he either stabs to death or shoots the cab driver, that's going to be classified as an acquaintance murder because of the perceived financial relationship that existed between the two parties. If the person had merely come up to the side of the cab and shot the cab driver, then that would have been classified as a stranger murder. But uh, you know, if you have somebody who drops off a package at your home, let's say a UPS driver or something, even if they don't say anything to you, if while they're there they see that, uh, well, you know, maybe it's an elderly woman who's living by herself, or at least he perceives that, maybe there's some valuable things that he sees maybe could be stolen, and later that night he comes by and he tries to rob her, uh, and she gets killed in the robbery then that's going to be classified as, a, as an acquaintance murder because of the previous relationship that they had had in terms of him dropping off the package. My guess is that those types of things aren't what most people are thinking about when they hear, uh, hear the term acquaintance murders. Now, um, there's one city that's done a very good job of uh, trying to keep this data, and that's uh, in terms of a precise breakdown of the relationship of acquaintance murders, and that's Chicago. And if you add together, look at the data from uh, 1990 through 1997, what you find is that uh, uh, if you add together uh, relatives, uh, friends, neighbors, which is in itself a fairly broad classification because it's people who defines people based upon how close geographically they live. And if you're talking about large public housing units, you can literally have tens of thousands of people who could be classified as neighbors and or roommates. So even if you add these fairly broad, some of these fairly broad classifications together, you end up with about 17% of the murders over that period of time fall into those categories. Now I'm not going to argue that that's not important, but what I would argue is it's probably a lot smaller than most people might think in terms of, uh, of what they normally hear. The other part of this claim, as I said, is the notion that anybody could be a murderer. And, 
And no matter how you cut it, murderers are by nowhere near even close to being an, your average citizen. The uh, typical adult murder, 90% of adult murders have an adult criminal record. About 88% of juvenile murders have a juvenile criminal record. These are people with low IQs. They're overwhelmingly young males. Uh, and uh, murders are also very geographically concentrated. 80% of the counties in the United States have zero murders in any given year. And even the 20% of the counties that experience at least one murder, it's very heavily concentrated within a very narrow range of, uh, of those counties. And, and there's another thing. One thing that's, that's not very politically correct to go into, but I guess I'll mention, that is uh, murders are, and it's probably a, uh, a big black mark on our country, but murders are very racially uh, concentrated. That uh, uh, you overwhelmingly, the murder rate among young black males in their teens and 20s is about nine times higher, for example, than it is for, uh, for white males of the same age group. And while a lot of people go and compare murder rates in the United States versus Europe, for example, if you compare the white murder rate in the United States versus the murder rate in Europe, the white murder rate in the United States falls about in the middle of the range of countries in Europe. And a lot of the difference is the high murder rates that we have in, in urban areas involving drug gangs and other things, that issues that we can talk about. Um, now, why do people push this myth the way they do. And the reason why I think they do, because the people who push this, I think, understand the problems with it, is, uh, is that they want to make people afraid of those who are around them. And the reason why they want to make f people afraid of those around them, because if you don't trust somebody who's near you, you loved ones that are near you, then you're going to be afraid to let them have a weapon of some type, because you're going to be afraid that they could go and turn it on you. And I think that's sad that people are made to be afraid of those people that they shouldn't be afraid of, that they have no legitimate reason to be afraid of. My guess is probably no one in this room knows uh, the types of people who would kind of fit the types of characteristics that we had that I was going through in terms of uh, uh, you know, any reasonable likelihood of somebody going committing a murder. And, um, and I just think it's sad when people are made needlessly afraid of those who are around them. Now. Another myth is uh, something I'm sure we've all heard, and that is uh, uh, the United States has a relatively high gun ownership rate, and the United States has a relatively high homicide rate. And so the claim is, is that it's the high gun ownership rate in the United States that's going and causing the high homicide rate that we have. The problem with this is that uh, it's usually just based upon four or five or six different countries to make a comparison. I'm sure you've all heard the countries, Japan, Canada, Britain, maybe Germany, the United States. And indeed, for that set of countries, that's generally true, though there's some comments one can make about those. But, and maybe a couple other countries are included. But we have data literally for dozens of different countries and why someone would go and pick four or five or six or seven countries to make a comparison has never been really explained to me. Uh, there are lots of countries in the world that have gun ownership rates similar to what we have here in the United States, some that have higher gun ownership rates than we have, that have among the lowest murder rates in the world. And the reverse is also true. Um, uh, some of the countries that, uh, well, in fact, if you look at like about the 10 countries with the high homis highest homicide rates in the world, these are all countries with very strict gun controls or bans. Uh, you know, even if you exclude countries like Venezuela and Colombia, which have their own drug problems and have homicide rates about 12 or 13 fold higher than what we have here in the United States, you have other countries like Russia, for example, which has a homicide rate of about five times higher than what we have here in the United States and essentially banned guns for about 50 years. You have Brazil, which also has a homicide rate of about five times higher than what we have here in the United States. They had had very strict re registration and licensing rules since 1936. About 80% of the guns in, uh, the that are sold by volume in the United States were banned around that time in Brazil. And recently, Brazil's gone the rest of the way and completely banned guns. And, uh, and yet, as I say, it has uh, one of the higher homicide rates in the world. And there are other countries that we can point to. Uh, 
Uh, the reverse is also true. If you look at countries that have high gun ownership rates, uh, in Europe, for example, you have Norway and Finland that have gun ownership rates roughly similar to what ours are, uh, that have low homicide rates. Switzerland, uh, which has a significantly higher gun ownership rate than what we have here in the United States, even once you exclude uh, the fact that 18 to 52-year-olds are required to keep automatic machine guns in their home uh, as a result of uh, compulsory military service, and just look at their privately owned guns. Uh, Switzerland has a handgun ownership rate of about 25 percentage points higher than what we have here. Uh, they have a much higher long gun ownership rate than what we have. And yet Switzerland has traditionally had one of the lowest homicide rates in Europe. Israel which probably has uh, the highest gun possession rates in the world by far, uh, has, uh, has a homicide rate that's about 40 percentage points, 40 percent lower than Israel, for example. And uh, now there are lots of problems with making international comparisons. One of the biggest problems, and, I, and let me just back up a second, and, the, and my own belief is that a lot of the noise that comes from the problems with the data makes it difficult to see, in fact, how strong the relationship is between gun ownership and crime, and that how stricter gun ownership is even more strongly related to uh, uh, increased crime than we find uh, in existing studies. But uh, one of the biggest problems is how do we know what gun ownership rates are in different countries? Well, the way we learn what gun ownership rates are is through surveys. And the problem is, is that if gun ownership is illegal in the country or if it's extremely restrictive, it's very unlikely that people are going to come forward and tell you whether or not they, in fact, own guns in the country. There was, for example, a, a rather well-known survey uh, in the mid-1980s by the UN of the former Soviet Union, and the survey indicated that the official gun ownership rate in the former Soviet Union was zero. Now, I don't know if you remember, but there were... Uh, uh, after the former Soviet Union fell uh, in 1991, there were civil wars that were breaking out in places like uh, Armenia and Tajikistan and other places that were being fought with weapons that people had apparently been storing since World War II or World War I in their homes uh, that apparently that they hadn't gone and told the police that they were committing, you know, or told these surveyors that they were committing what was essentially a felony in the former Soviet Union. Now, there's ways you can try to deal with these problems. There are, also, there are all sorts of problems with the international data. Countries don't even all measure homicide rates the same way, amazingly enough. The differences in measuring arrest rates and other types of factors that you'd like to try to account for and explaining differences. Um, and so what I do in my book and, uh, and what I've done in other research is that you can look at surveys across the United States. They're simultaneously giving across all states at the same time to see how gun ownership rate not only varies across states, but also over time. Because while you have jurisdictions like Chicago and Washington, D.C., where gun ownership may essentially be outlawed, or at least extremely restricted, um, uh, you, uh, those jurisdictions are relatively limited. And at least the problems in terms of people not being willing to come forward and reporting whether they own guns isn't going to be as strict as it would be with a lot of this international comparison. Plus. It's much easier to believe that you're comparing apples to apples when you're comparing crime rates across different jurisdictions or trying to account for other factors that could affect crime. And what you find is that uh, those places with the highest gun ownership rates tend to have the lowest violent crime rates. But what I find much more convincing, because I think it's very hard to actually control for all the different factors that vary across places that explain differences in crime rates or gun ownership rates, is that you find that those states which have had the biggest relative increases in gun ownership over time have experienced the biggest relative drops in, uh, in violent crime rates. Now, uh, <clears throat> there's uh, another myth I'll go through, or at least we can classify this as a misleading statement, and that is the claim that uh, 11.5 or 12 children a day die from guns. Uh, President Clinton, when he brings this up, constantly makes reference to the need that this implies for trigger locks for guns. And if you've seen, as I'm sure probably all of you have seen at least a couple times over the last seven years, the public service announcements that the Clinton administration's put on making this claim, 
uh, you'll see the voices or faces of young seven and eight year olds. They've never included uh, pictures of voices of anybody age 10 or older. And surely the impression that these public service ads give and the comments that the president makes is that uh, these are young children that we're talking about. And again, this is, as I said, this is fairly misleading. If you look at the numbers, what they're defining as a child is anybody under the age of 20. And it involves all types of gun deaths, homicides, accidental gun deaths, suicides, as well as justifiable homicides. And overwhelmingly, these are people at the very top end of this age range. About 70% of the deaths involve 17, 18, and 19-year-olds. Overwhelmingly, homicides uh, appears to be primarily involved in uh, gang fights over drug turf. And uh, when you look at the types of uh, uh, the age range for those that are usually referred to, or at least one is implicit referred to in these ads, uh, children under the age of 10, you in fact find that only about 2% of these deaths, of these 11.5 deaths a day, involve children under the age of, of 10. And I suppose one point to bring out with regard to this is that uh, I don't, it's hard to believe that any type of trigger lock that you're going to require with the sale of a gun or any type of locking device, for that matter, that you may want to have is going to stop an 18-year-old gang member from getting into a gang fight over trying to control drug turf. It might make sense, it might be possible to stop a 9-year-old from going and getting a gun, uh, but it's not going to stop uh, somebody who's essentially an adult from uh, improperly using a gun. And so it's, you know, it's just, it seems like the vast percentage of that number is irrelevant to the type of claim that's being made. Now, the final myth that I'll go over <clears throat> is the notion or the claim that I'm sure we've all heard, it's probably the most pernicious one, about uh, uh, having a gun in the home is more likely to kill you or a loved one than it is to be used to kill in self-defense. And uh, there are a few studies upon which this is based, all done by the same sets of authors published in medical journals, where uh, what they'll do is, They'll go and find, they'll look at either a city or a few cities over a year or over a period of a few years, and they'll identify anybody who died uh, in or near a residence as a result of a gunshot, and then they'll ask the relatives of the deceased whether or not that person owned a gun or whether somebody else in the residence owned the gun. And then what they'll do is they'll put together a comparison sample where they'll find people who are the same age, sex, and race who live within a mile of the deceased and ask them whether they owned a gun and then essentially run a regression on whether you owned a gun uh, or whether uh, uh, the person died on whether or not they owned a gun and they find a, a positive relationship. Now, there are a couple of big problems with it. And there are lots of big problems. I'll just go through a couple. One is... They assume that if you owned a gun and a person died from a gunshot there, then it was that gun that was used in the death. In fact, when people have gone back and tried to look at these numbers, even when you include suicides, at most 14% of the guns that were being blamed for the deaths, in fact, could be attributed to that death. The other 86%, at least, of the, uh, of the gun deaths were being falsely attributed to the weapons that were in the home. They were due to deaths that were due to weapons being brought in from the outside. Uh, another big problem with this is, that, is the fact that they're only counting as a benefit cases where um, uh, the gun is used to kill the attacker. In fact, that's incredibly rare. Less than one out of every thousand times that people use guns defensively is the attacker killed. Surveys indicate that up to about 98% of the time, simply brandishing a gun is sufficient to cause a criminal to break off an attack. And about the 2% of the time when the gun's fired, about three-quarters of those are warning shots. Less than one-half of 1% 1 of the time is the weapon fired in the direction of the attacker. And a lot of those don't even hit. And uh, woundings are about eight times more frequently than the attacker's killed. And so what essentially what you've done is you've given zero weight to all those cases where simply a brandishing was sufficient to cause a criminal to break off an attack. And you've given zero weight to cases where you fired a warning shot. And you've given zero weight to cases where you've actually wounded the attacker or fired some type of uh, warning shot. And, uh, you know, there are other problems I could go into there. But basically what you find is that 
when you look at all the data for the United States and look at changes in gun ownership and try to add up uh, any deaths that might result from accidental gunshots or suicides as well as murders, what you find is that on net the presence of guns definitely saves lives as, a as opposed to uh, uh, costing lives. Now, what I like to try to do is just spend some time on a couple of uh, laws that have gotten a lot of attention recently. Um, uh, one type of law has to do with uh, some of the discussion I, ha I had earlier about the trigger locks, because my guess is that if any type of gun legislation passed Congress this year, it would involve mandating trigger locks or some type of safe storage of guns. Uh, 18 states now, with the passage a couple weeks ago in New York, now have some type of safe storage legislation where essentially they make it a, a crime, either a misdemeanor or a felony. If someone stores a gun in such a way as uh, a juvenile, and the age, what's defined as a juvenile, varies across different states, gets a hold of a gun and uses it improperly in some way. Now, the benefits of these laws are, are pretty straightforward to state. The claim is, is that uh, requiring people to lock up their guns will reduce juvenile accidental gun deaths, they reduce juvenile suicides, and the claim is that they'll also reduce crime rates because by making it more difficult for criminals to go and get a hold of a gun in terms of a residential robbery or burglary, uh, it's going to make it more difficult for them to go and turn around and use guns in a uh, commission of a crime. The problem is when you look at the data, you don't find any of those things. What you find, in fact, is that there's no change in either juvenile accidental gun deaths or suicides, uh, but there, in fact, is an increase in violent crime rates that occur when these laws get passed. And when you look at the data, it becomes pretty clear why that's, why that's true. If you take the issue of uh, juvenile accidental gun deaths, first of all, my guess is these are probably a lot less frequent than most people might think. In 1997, for uh, children under age 10, there was uh, 48 accidental gun deaths in the United States. Centers for Disease Control identified five of those as involving handguns. Um, uh, but my guess is also when most people hear the, that number, they come away with the thought that it's a young child shooting another young child under age 10. In fact, that's simply not true. Uh, you literally only have, it appears, a few cases a year where a child under 10 shoots another child under age 10. Um, the typical person who accidentally fires a gun is someone who's in their late teens or 20s, who's a male, who's either a drug addict or an alcoholic, who uh, has uh, uh, arrest history for violent crimes, and in fact is probably uh, quite likely to have their driver's license suspended at the time of the accidental shooting. And there are a couple key things, I think, to bring away from that. The first one is, um, while it might make sense that uh, a gun lock might stop someone under the age of 10 from accidentally firing a gun, it seems very difficult to believe that any type of locking device that you're going to have is going to stop a 24-year-old male, let's say, from accidentally firing his own gun. It's simply not meant to try to stop that type of situation. The second point is that uh, the households in which there's some risk occurring, these are not particularly law-abiding households. And there's a real question whether or not these are the types of people who are going to be going out and obeying the law. Um, uh, you know, a few months ago, we had this situation in Michigan, the Kayla Rowland death. And uh, in one sense, it was extremely unusual. But in another sense, it was quite typical. The sense it was extremely unusual is that you had a six-year-old pulling the trigger of the gun, uh, killing another six-year-old. The case in which it was much more common was where did he get the gun? The kid lived in a crack house. His father was in jail. His mother was absent. Uh, she's a drug addict. Uh, the uncle who was taking care of him and the other adult male that was in the residence uh, both had outstanding felony arrest warrants. All the weapons that were in the home were, were stolen weapons. And I know President Clinton likes to claim that the young girl would be alive today if the trigger lock legislation had passed last year. But it seems at least questionable to me whether or not these people would have gone out and retroactively, even though they weren't even required by law, technically, to go and buy trigger locks to put on the stolen guns that they had in the home. But, but the concern that this raises is this, and that is, 
whose behavior is going to change as a result of passing these laws. My, my guess is, and I think the data shows this, is that when you see these laws get passed, you see a drop. It's the law-abiding citizens who are going to change their behavior. You see a drop, a sudden one-time drop in gun ownership that occurs when these laws get passed. And the longer that they're in effect, the greater the percentage of the population that owns guns, uh, the greater the rate at which they lock up their guns. And, and that poses uh, a real possibility here that people are no longer going to be able to have guns to be able to use defensively. And even if they do have the guns in the residence, they're not going to be as quickly available to be able to use defensively as, uh, as they were previously. And so what you have to wait is any possible reduction that you might have in terms of juvenile accidental gun deaths with uh, any changes that might occur in terms of things like crime rates. Now, uh, let me see if I can... Now, what uh, this first graph shows, this is just the raw data <coughs> for uh, uh, accidental deaths for juveniles, uh, looking at before and after the passage of these state safe storage laws. This is for data from uh, 1977 through 1996. This line here in the middle, essentially year zero, is the year the different states passed the law. In one state, it may be 87. In another, it might be 95. And these are uh, the years after the safe storage law, the first year, second, third, fourth. And these are the years prior to the adoption of the safe storage laws. And these are for the states that had the law in effect for at least four years. And uh, this top line is for all accidental deaths from all sources. It's actually about 10 times higher, but I divided it by 10 just to be able to kind of get it on the same graph as these other two lines that we're going to look at. This middle line here is for all accidental gun deaths involving juveniles under the age of 15. And this bottom line here is for uh, accidental handgun deaths for children under the age of 15. And um, there are 15 states that had the law in effect for at least four years here. And there are a couple things you see. In fact, there is some drop in overall uh, accidental gun deaths for juveniles of about 30% or so. Uh, virtually in, the entire drop is in two states, though, uh, Florida and Iowa. The other states, the other 13 states, there's basically no change. If you look at accidental handgun deaths, though, it's very flat, and then it actually rises. It actually ends up about 30 percentage point, 30 percent higher than it was uh, before the start. So this is uh, some mixed evidence. There seems to be some overall decline in uh, in uh, juvenile accidental de gun deaths. But one thing to do is to compare it now to the states that didn't change their laws over the same period of time. Now, on average, the states that passed uh, uh, these safe storage laws did so in about July 91. And so if you go up to 91 here, um, what you find is that actually there's about a 60% drop in juvenile accidental gun deaths over the same period of time for the states that didn't pass a safe storage law as compared to about the 30% drop that you had for the states that did. And if you look at handgun deaths, what you find is that uh, 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 you actually had about a 60% drop in accidental handgun deaths for children under the age of 15 for the states that didn't change their laws as compared to the actual increase in uh, uh, and handgun deaths, which one would presume you would you would expect normally a priori to get the largest benefit from that, because that's usually what people point to in terms of the benefits. And I also just mention over that same period of time, you're having a big drop overall in all types of accidental deaths too. So it's really difficult to see any unusual drop that's occurring just in those states that pass the. Uh, um, uh, safe storage laws. In fact, if anything, they seem to have a smaller drops. Now, I won't go through the suicide stuff very much because I don't really think there's much of a debate in the academic literature over this. People who have looked at the presence of guns uh, in the home, the availability of guns, uh, the vast majority of studies, most studies don't find any impact on, on suicides with guns. Uh, there's a few that do find uh, impacts on suicides with guns based upon the availability or different types of laws uh, on guns. But 
even the few that find some effect on suicides with guns, no one finds a relationship between different types of gun laws and total suicides. And I think what most people believe is that uh, 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 even if you can impact this one particular method, somebody can go and commit a suicide, you're not going to change the total number of suicides. You'll change the method in which people go and commit suicides. And I'll just show you one thing from this graph here. The one with the squares, this is the suicide rate for juveniles under age 15 with guns. And it ends up in virtually the exact same place four full years afterwards as it did the year that the law was passed. Uh, it goes up a little bit at first and then comes back down, but then ends up essentially the same place it did before. And there's no statistically significant change that occurs there. But I, I won't go th through the suicide stuff there because it's basically, it's hard to see any systematic impact here. Now finally, I'll look at violent crime rates. And I could break this down lots of different ways. But um, just one thing to keep in mind is, as I said, the average year that these states adopted these safe storage laws was in the middle of 1991. And if you know about uh, uh, the Uniform Crime Report data nationally, what you find is that that's the point in time when murder rates and violent crime rates peaked nationally. They were falling after that. And uh, what you see happening is at the same time that you saw violent crime rates start to fall nationally, and I have two different lines here. This bottom line is for the 10 states that had the safe storage laws in effect for at least four years. The top line is for the six states that had it in effect for at least five years. And what you see happening is right at the same time when violent crime rates were starting to fall nationally, you're seeing a big increase right at that point, right when these laws are getting passed. You know, they're in effect for about half the year here, right at the time when these laws are getting passed. And while it keeps on falling faster and faster nationally, these violent crime rates stay higher at this new higher level. Maybe they're starting to come down a little bit when you look at the, uh, the six states with the data for at least five years. But it's nowhere catching up to the national drop in violent crime that we've been experiencing over that same period of time. And if you break it down by uh, category of violent crime, what you find is that it's pretty much across the board that you see these increases. You'll see particularly large increases in rapes and uh, robberies and uh, in aggravated assaults. But there's also an increase that occurs in terms of uh, uh, murder rates. <clears throat> now, uh, I'm just going to take this off. Right. <clears throat> I'm just going to take this off. The uh, now another law. Well, that's uh, but I'm not going to maybe now. Um, uh, another law that uh, gets a lot of attention is uh, are these concealed handgun laws that we now have in uh, 31 states in the United States, right to carry laws. There's another 12 states that have more restrictive laws. Uh, the 31 states are usually referred to as right to carry states. They have certain objective criteria. Once you uh, meet certain requirements in terms of uh, uh, criminal background checks, in terms of uh, uh, paying your fees, uh, uh, being a certain age, about half the states require some type of uh, training, then, uh, and you apply for a permit, then you're automatically granted the permit. Uh, there are another 12 states which are more restrictive. They're called May Issue states. And basically what those have is that, uh, uh, what's going on here? The, uh, <coughs> our, um, are, uh, they have uh, what's called discretion, where some local public official uh, has to uh, approve you. Has, you have to demonstrate need to them that uh, you have. Uh, I'm supposed to guess which way you're going to be going in a second here on this. Why don't we just keep it off, and I'll just try to speak louder. Um, and that is, uh, you have to demonstrate need to some local public official, and. Uh, in those states, grant many fewer permits, uh, and also the types of people who get permits tend to be quite different. 
Uh, and then there's seven states uh, plus the District of Columbia which don't allow people to uh, carry concealed handguns. And uh, uh, now we have a lot of data now on this and we can look at a lot of issues about what happens to crime rates generally and we could try to account for lots of factors that uh, can explain changes in, uh, in violent crime rates over time. And what you find is that even after accounting for things like arrest rates, conviction rates, prison sentence lengths, the death penalty, many different types of hiring policies for police or, or police policies in terms of law enforcement, as well as income, demographics, poverty, things like illegal drug prices. What you find is that those states that adopt these rules have drops in violent crime rate that are faster than any national drops that you have in violent crime and also faster than other states in their region. And that the drop uh, increases over time the longer these laws are in effect. And I'll just show you for overall violent crime rates. This is like the other diagram that we had. This is year zero when different states adopt these laws. This is the data from 1977 through 1996 <clears throat> for all the counties in the United States. Violent crime rates were fairly flat right up until the point in time when these laws were adopted. And then they began to fall. And the size of the drop, as I said before, increases the longer these laws are in effect. And basically, there's a very simple reason for that. And that is uh, the percentage of uh, the adult population with these permits changes over time. That when you first pass these laws, uh, very few people who are eventually going to go and get the permits, rush out and get it right away. It can take 10, 15 years before you kind of end up with the steady state level. Uh, in the state with people getting permits. You know, for example, for Florida, first year after they had the law, they had about 30,000 people with permits. Four years after the law was in effect, they had about 67,000 people with permits. About 10 years after the law was in effect, they had about 192,000 people with permits. And now there's about 250,000 active permits in the state. And basically what you see is that as the probability that an adult in a state is going to be able to defend themselves increases, you see bigger drops in violent crime. And, uh, and you see this in other types of uh, for violent crimes also. Let me show you for, uh, for murder rates. Murder rates were fairly flat up until the point in time when these laws were adopted and began to fall. Rape rates are fairly dramatic. They were actually rising on average relative to other states up until the point in time when these right to carry laws were adopted and then began to fall after that. And then uh, robbery. Robbery rates were falling or rising right up in, fairly quickly right up until the point in time when these laws were adopted and then began to fall. And then for aggravated assaults, the states that ended up adopting uh, right to carry laws, actually they're aggravated assaults rates were actually falling <clears throat> relative to other states up until the time when the law was adopted and then began to fall even faster than they were previously after the, uh, the adoption of these laws. You know, there's lots of things we could look at here I could go into, but um, uh, for time I won't go into it. But the, um, uh, you know, let me just summarize with a couple points here. Um, there are lots of things that affect crime rates. And uh, my research indicates that the most important single factor, I think, is the police. And now, that said, uh, I think the police themselves even realize that even though they may be extremely important in reducing crime, as I say, probably the single most important factor, they simply can't be there all the time. They virtually always arrive on the crime scene after the crime has been committed. And I think that raises an important question that needs to be answered. And the question is, what do we recommend that people do when they're having to confront a criminal by themselves? And it, it's a question that people just don't want to seem to address. I mean, they want to just kind of assume that the crime will go away. You know, they'll say things, well, I don't want to live in a society where people find it necessary to go and be able to have a gun to defend themselves. It would be nice if we lived in a world without violence. It would be nice if we lived in a world where nobody else had nuclear weapons, too, or something like that. But uh, unilateral disarmament's not always the wisest course of action for one to take in these types of situations. And, and the data, I think, overwhelmingly shows that by far the safest course of action for someone to take is, is to have a gun. And, um, uh, you know, it's interesting 
uh, people who want to have restrictions on gun ownership, you know, when, when it comes to the bottom line, they seem to frequently act in ways that they believe this to be the case. I mean, not only do you have somebody like Rosie O'Donnell, who recently uh, it came out that uh, she has her, arm, her bodyguards getting guns to be able to protect herself. I mean, she'll make the argument. I mean, here's somebody who just in the middle of May was on this week with Sam and Koki and arguing that uh, there should be no laws that allow citizens to be able to go and carry concealed handguns, nobody other than police. And, uh, uh, and uh, she's argued that anybody other than police that has a gun should go to jail. Now, but uh, she somehow makes the claim now that, well, she feels threatened by violence, and that's the reason why she thinks it's necessary <laughs> to go and have a gun. But the problem is, that's the reason why anybody has a gun defensively. It's not just a situation that's unique to herself. She makes the argument that, uh, well, she still personally doesn't own a gun. And I think that misses the point. I mean, if she, if she has armed bodyguards, it's not really as necessary for her to be able to have a gun herself in order to protect herself or her family. Or she makes the claim that, well, she doesn't allow guns in her home. Well, if you have armed body guards, apparently, as she does, walking around patrolling her yard outside of her home, the need for having actually a gun inside your home is probably greatly reduced relative to what it would be <laughs> otherwise. And, uh, but, I mean, it's not just Rosie O'Donnell. You have uh, you know, President Clinton, who, as far as I can tell during his administration, has never once mentioned the benefit of people using guns defensively. Uh, he always talks about the rights of sportsmen or something like that, but will never once mention that there might be a benefit for people using guns defensively. Uh, uh, he has on body guards. I mean, apparently he thinks that there's some deterrence effect from that. I mean, if he really didn't think that this was an argument to be made at all about defensive gun use, there's an easy way for him to demonstrate that, and that is to disband the Secret Service or something, or at least not have them protect himself. But it's just not... It's just not President Clinton. You also have a whole range of things. You have Andrew Cuomo, who's saying that we need to buy back these guns from uh, public housing units. And even when he's confronted by the evidence that indicates that there's no criminals turning in their guns, these are law-abiding citizens. And uh, most of the guns they're also turning in are inoperable guns. But uh, you know, he'll say, well, even if we can just get rid of a couple guns from even these law-abiding citizens, that's great. You know, here's a guy who has round-the-clock bodyguard protection, even in some of the safest areas in the country. Uh, he wouldn't think about going around without that. And yet, um, he won't let these people who have to live in some of the most dangerous areas in the country, he doesn't want them to be able to own a gun themselves for, uh, for protection. We can go through lots of other people like that. But, uh, but I think that's one of the questions that needs to be asked. Uh, you know, what do we recommend that these people do? And simply... Uh, simply behaving passively is not uh, is not a very good option. Uh, anyway, there's other things I could go through, but I appreciate your time. I appreciate you inviting me.